Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hartz, and tonight we're going to break down the Packers' dominant 34-17 victory over the 49ers and go over all the injuries you should be watching for ahead of Week 9 or maybe some injuries you aren't going to be watching for because sometimes, you know, you get those uh, notifications on whatever app you use for fantasy football. It gets awfully confusing, so I want to sort that out, go over the Packers' win, and get you all out here. So thank you, as always, for tuning in, bringing new episodes of the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and let's get to it. So, yes, Packers 34, 49ers 17 really was not that close. I mean, this was truly a, a game where the 49ers had two uh, pretty much late garbage time touchdown drives. Uh, Nick Mullins won the more deceiving, kind of decent stat line, awful performance kind of things you'll ever see. 22 for 35, 291 yards, one touchdown and one pick. Uh, we saw Jarek McKinney, no slides way over for goal line touchdown. And uh, Richie James ended up getting a touchdown and completely broken coverage in the fourth quarter. So, just be careful before you go back, you know, and sit make too many kind of big takeaways about this game. I mean, look, Richie James had himself a great one. I'm not trying to take anything away from him. Nine catches on 13 targets for 184 yards in the score, but, I mean, that touchdown, the Packers defense just literally did not look at him. Yair Alexander got concussion and was out of the game for pretty much the first quarter on, and again, just so much of this. I mean, he had like another, I think it was a 47 yard screen where, again, just no one was really there, so credit to Richie James for getting the touches, but I mean, it was kind of clear that at this point in the game that he was just the last guy that they had for for Shanahan to really scheme big touches to. I think Aikman said at one point during the broadcast that roughly like 85% of Shanahan's plays were designed to go to Brandon Ayuk. So once he got pulled out, uh, clearly they kind of just went to the next man up mentality with Richie James. And hey, he made the most of it. And if, if you know all these guys, if Debo, if Ayuk, if Bourne are going to stay out, then it's going to be Richie James, just like we thought it might be uh, Jermichael Hasty, But just one of these things where it's going to continue to be uh, you know, okay, if all these guys stay hurt, maybe Richie James will get this role again. Wouldn't exactly count on it. It sounds like, you know, Ayuk or Bourne at minimum could be back sooner rather than later. So, if either of those guys are back, James goes back to being, you know, a nobody in fantasy land. So, you know, definitely not someone I'd be breaking the bank to get the fab on, but credit to him for putting together this big performance. Otherwise, pretty uh, soft night from the 49ers receiving game. Uh, River Craft, Craycraft, I- I'll work on it, everyone. But uh, he had a, a potential touchdown that he uh, ended up dropping as he was going to the ground. I did think it was an incompletion. Sometimes you just know, and that was, uh, you know, my opinion with that one. As always, though, Des caught it. But otherwise, you know, Trent Taylor, one catch for nine yards and just four targets. Uh, Ross Dwelly was the tight end to have here. Three catches, 52 yards uh, on three targets. Jordan Reed just was not involved. He had an early catch and then, you know, had an interception that was targeted for him uh, from Mullins that, you know, was 100% on Mullins there. But overall, uh, and again, these are unaffected official snaps, still haven't had everything finalized yet, but Ross Dwelly played 28 snaps, Jordan Reed just 12, so disappointing from there. Also, like I said, the Hasty uh, usage was just, you know, disappointing as well, because Jarek McKinnon, 32 snaps, Jermichael Hasty only 11, McKinnon had 12 carries, two Hasties, four. We knew that McKinnon was going to get the pass down work, which he did. He had four targets to Hasty's two, and one of those uh, Hasty fumbled at the end, and uh, was lucky enough to get back on it, so situation that was not ideal uh, for... Or did he fumble at the end? I thought he did. Excuse me if I'm wrong on that. I thought Hasty fumbled one at the end. I will uh, watch the film again tomorrow to make sure, uh, but it did seem that way. Either way, it wasn't uh, recovered by the defense, so probably not an issue, but, you know, Hasty is working behind McKinnon pretty clearly right now. You know, we, we heard the tired leg reports. We saw uh, weeks, you know, without Mostert where Jeff Wilson jumped the line, but, you know, with all these guys out, with Coleman, with Mostert, with Wilson, it does seem like McKinnon is going to be that number one guy so, you know, Hasty was someone that we were kind of on this week, you know, expecting him to get at least, uh, you know, double-digit carries, which I think he would have in a more positive game script. But it goes to show, you know, in this situation with McKinnon being the pass down back, I mean, just kind of like similar what happened to Alexander Madison when he busted a while ago. I know we weren't treating uh, Hasty quite as high as Alexander Madison, but, you know, when you do have a non-starter in a fluid situation, these sort of things can happen when the team gets the ever-living piss beat out of them. And that's going to pretty much do it on the 49er side of the ball again. This was just a bad game. I mean, Mullins, one just kind of bad play after another. He was under pressure a lot of the night, but just general erraticness the whole time. They were kind of calling for Peterman uh, throughout, the, th- throughout the evening, and, you know, I wouldn't have mind seeing him at that point. And by Peterman, I mean C.J. Bethard. So my bad there. It is uh, 11.30 Columbus, Ohio uh, p.m. right now, but uh, I need to get better and not mix up my backup quarterbacks that happen to be on the west coast of the country. Uh, Green Bay, so Aaron Rodgers, 305 yards, four touchdowns. 
25 of 31. I mean, they cannot do a thing to him. And by not do a thing to Aaron Rodgers, I mean mostly not do a thing to Devontae Adams. Caught 10 of 12 targets for 173 yards and a score. Uh, the touchdown, you know, was easy enough. And by easy enough, I mean he got single coverage. Rodgers chucked it down there, and it just seems easy enough because these guys are doing this week after week after week. It's not enough that Devontae Adams is one of the league's most talented wide receivers. He has to also have this mind meld chemistry with Aaron Rodgers that is probably only rivaled by Russell Wilson and Tyler Lockett around the entire league right now. So that's what we saw in the first one. It's like truly any time that Rodgers thinks he can get Devontae on one guy, no matter who it is, the ball is going there. Uh, you know, even though there was pretty good coverage, Devontae got a foot down, got the hand down. Apparently they ruled it with the elbow. I don't know why a hand wouldn't be worth the foot. And before people say because a hand doesn't rule you down, an elbow does. Well, a toe doesn't rule you down and that counts. So, you know, to me, it's a situation where if you get two different body parts down in bounds, that should be a catch. But I digress. Uh, other than Adams, though, we actually did see a nice game from Marquez Baldus Scantling. Just had a brutal drop uh, in the second quarter on like a short crosser that could have been a first down. And, you know, everyone was getting their Will Fuller jokes out there on the old Twitter sphere. But after that, uh, he did rein in a 52 yard touchdown catch and then got a goal line touchdown from the from the one yard line. If you were wondering, yes, Aaron Rodgers does lead the, uh, lead the league in touchdown passes from the one yard line with 25 over the past decade. Uh, he certainly did not want to give Aaron Jones a rock down there and uh, got another one to Mercedes Lewis on the evening as well. So again, four touchdowns for Rodgers. Great game. Aaron Jones ended up playing a lot more than the you know, kind of reports were indicating. It seemed like a situation where if it wasn't going to be you know an emergency only role, at the very least a limited one, not really at all. So he played 39 snaps. Tyler Irvin played 20. Dexter Williams only had two touches before being ruled out with a knee injury. So, you know, maybe that changed things a little bit, but Either way, you know, this was kind of the Aaron Jones' usual role. He did not get the Jamal Williams just overall featured back gig that we've been seeing with Aaron Jones out. Urban was pretty involved, and he looked good to his credit. I mean, they used him a lot down the field. He ended up having four catches, 48 yards on five targets. Aaron Jones, five targets of his own, caught all five of them. The 15 carries, 58 yards, just no touchdowns. And look, Aaron Jones has been, you know, pretty much the premier touchdown scorer out the position over these past two years. So in a situation where the Packers score 34 points, uh, you know, if you run this game back 10 times and they score 34 every time, this is probably the only one where, you know, Jones isn't finding the end zone at least once. So frustrating night. You know, I would imagine a lot of people probably kind of benched Aaron Jones because of the concern about the injury and limited snaps. So uh, from that perspective, you should be happy he didn't have too big of a performance. But I think the good news is that he got in there, uh, got out, didn't re-aggravate anything. It wasn't for lack of trying because he was out there in the beginning of the fourth quarter getting touches, you know, with this game well out of hand, 31-3. to three. But, you know, it is what it is, and uh, he is healthy here moving forward. So, if uh, you know, even if Jamal Williams and uh, Dylan remain sidelined, it does seem like Irvin, you know, they trust him enough to take away some of Jones' work. But, hey, if we're getting 15 carries and five targets a week in this offense with a talent like Aaron Jones, that is all we need. Uh, last note here on these two squads, uh, I guess Robert Tanyan ghosted here, uh, only one catch, four or five yards. He played 36 snaps, but Mercedes Lewis is right there with 30. Jay Sternberger with 14. I mean, Tanyan, they, they like him, and he's going to have bigger games. But truly, I mean, Alan Lazard is going to come back too. Everything behind Devontae Adams in his passing game is just up for grabs. Like, we don't know. And, you know, kind of the idea that maybe Tanya could be this consistent top five, top seven tight end, not so much. Because really, outside of, uh, you know, at this point with Kittle out, outside of Travis Kelsey and Darren Waller, there really isn't another tight end that you feel that great about. I know TJ Hawkinson, you know, maybe Dallas Goddard after this bye week when he's back. But truly just, you know, uh, who's who, a hellhole of a position this year. Only other... Uh, I think that about does it, everyone. Okay, I want to note one more thing with Devontae Adams. So he in his last 10 games, including the playoffs, I mean, the guys, the receiving lines are absolutely out of this world. Seven catches, 103 yards in the score. 13 catches, 116 yards. Seven catches, 93 yards in the score. Eight catches, 160 yards in two scores. Nine catches, 138 yards. Week one of 20, uh, 20. 14 catches, 156 yards, two scores. Six catches, 61 yards, zero scores. Credit to you, Carlton Davis. 13 catches, not 196 yards, two scores. Last week, seven catches, 53 yards, and three scores. And this week, 10 catches, 173 yards, and a touchdown. Just absolutely blistering pace, and it is amazing to see. Uh, fantasies, no doubt, undisputed, number one wide receiver moving out, even with a healthy, potentially healthy Michael Thomas coming back. So that's going to do it for the Thursday night matchup. want to give a quick shout-out to our sponsors before we get on to the injuries. Uh, all first-time depositors at Monkey Knife Fight that put at least 20 bucks in their account while using promo code 
code PFF or receive a free PFF Edge annual subscription. That's a $40 value for just $20. And you'll get the opportunity to turn that $20 into even more money playing daily fantasy and prop games at one of the fastest growing fantasy sports sites in the USA, Monkey Knife Fight. So go to Monkey Knife Fight and deposit your $20 with promo code PFF today to receive your free PFF Edge annual subscription. Love that, everybody. All right, I want to go through these injuries now, uh, starting off with the Seahawks. So Chris Carson with the foot, Carlos Hyde with the hamstring, still sidelined. They will be getting back Jamal Adams, but, you know, keep in mind, Jamal Adams was out there in that Week 2 game when Cam Newton, and particularly Julian Edelman in Adams' coverage even, uh, you know, were making him look like a freaking non-er out there at times. So a situation where the Seahawks, hey, they have the league's single worst pass rush. I'm not saying Adams or Quentin Dunbar or, you know, Griffin, any of these guys are bad necessarily in coverage, but, you know, they're certainly not getting any help with this pass rush. And I do not expect that to be changing this week. But on the running back, so apparently Pete Carroll has been saying that, you know, all week Carson will test his foot on Friday. We do have Travis Homer who's been practicing this week with his knee injury. So I don't think DJ Dallas is going to command the entire backfield like he did last week. I mean, Homer was ahead of him on the depth chart for a reason. I do think it'll be more of a 50-50 situation. I don't think it's going to swing entirely towards Homer. But, you know, even if Carson and Hyde remain out, I would not, you know, be wanting to treat uh, DJ Dallas as his top 20 option you need to have in your lineup in this spot. Looking at the Broncos, uh, Tim Patrick's been limited all week with the hamstring hamstring injury. Philip Lindsay returned to practice Thursday with the foot injury. It seems like a situation where Melvin Gordon could be phased out, you know, sooner rather than later. He's just really not playing well at all lately, and uh, you know, been the single most inefficient receiver in the league in terms of yards per target among guys with at least 15 targets. So not doing good there. And Philip Lindsay has provided them some juice since he's got back from injury. But for now, you know, try to stay away from both these guys. They're you know, I have both them ranked outside my top 24 this week, and just in this pretty volatile Broncos offense. I know the matchup is good, but truly Lindsey and Gordon are splitting stuff pretty much right down the middle and they're not really showing any sort of commitment to the run game at this time. I know last week was, you know, kind of different game script, but, you know, this week could be the same way. And I just say with Patrick, you know, potentially being back out there, don't be afraid. I know uh, in DFS, but on DraftKings, you know, Drew Locke and Jerry Jerry, the real popular ones, Patrick can ball. And if he's healthy and he's out there and he's ready to go, he could be an awesome pivot off of Judy and, you know, he could put up points. I like Judy as well. I mean, Judy is someone we can uh, line up, you know, as an upside wide receiver this week absolutely but you know Tim Patrick in his own rise and playing some good ball all season Chargers quarterback Justin Herbert uh, has been added to the injury report, but he's still practicing in full right shoulder. Just something to keep an eye on. You know, it looks like it's going to be a shootout between the Chargers and Raiders. But, you know, remember this moment if we you know, look back on this next week and wonder why Herbert only had 15 or 20 pass attempts or something wild like that. I don't think it's anything to worry about. I'm not going to let it, you know, change my uh, just kind of. I'm not going to change my thoughts on this game or the Chargers offense as a whole this week or Herbert's as a fantasy guy, but I just think, uh, you know, something to monitor and see if it ends up popping up more moving forward. Uh, on the Raiders side of the ball, Brian Edwards is back to a full practice with a foot injury. You know, that's that's risky for Nelson Aguilar. That's why he's in the starting lineup right now. I mean, Henry Ruggs, I know Aguilar has been playing arguably better than Ruggs and being used more in terms of targets, but come on. They didn't draft this guy as number one wide receiver to sit him down for Nelson Aguilar right now. And again, Aguilar, we've been talking him up all year, all season on this podcast the guy's been playing great ball he's gotten better i get that but if anything he's gonna be splitting snaps with brian Edwards. i think rugs uh stays good to go so in the shootout if you want exposure to the wide receiver room for the raiders i think rugs is to play over these other guys for sure uh josh jacobs was a dmp on thursday with a knee and illness he's had the knee thing all year but the illness is new and the raiders did promote uh you know theoretic from the practice squad to the active roster so something to keep an eye on yeah definitely you know don't don't uh, just set your lineup tonight and not look at it until Sunday before checking in on Jacob's status. Titans slot receiver Adam Humphreys uh, hasn't practiced all week with a concussion. So A.J. Brown and Corey Davis season. I invite you guys to check out the uh, Thursday edition of this podcast where I talked with the fancy footballers, Jason Moore, about this exact topic and you know, what we can expect from A.J. Brown and Corey Davis moving forward. Look, A.J. B. is the wide receiver one, but Corey Davis, he can be a wide receiver too. Ryan Tannehill, he's been a top 10 QB over these past two years. The offense is moving so much faster this year. It makes sense that we can now have potentially two weekly fancy relevant wide receivers. Uh, with the Saints, Alvin Kamara popped up with a foot injury, but he practiced in full on Thursday and is good to go. Continue to treat him as the overall fancy RB1. Uh, Drew Brees limited with a shoulder injury. Same thing as Herbert. You know, just keep it in mind. Obviously, obviously, you know, arm strength and deep ball can't get too much worse right now, but uh, obviously something to do keep an eye on with Brees. 
And then Michael Thomas has been limited on Wednesday and Thursday with the ankle and hamstring. Does seem like he is on track to get back there. So look, Michael Thomas is active. He needs to be in fantasy football lineups of all shapes and sizes. But, you know, tough matchup here against Carlton Davis. I mentioned before in, in that Devontae Adams stat line. I mean, Davis made Adams look human. Uh, he squared off against Allen Robinson. Robinson got like 90 yards, but I think it took him 16 targets. And he pretty much shut down Michael Thomas in week one, holding him under 20 yards. So Saints got the W. I get that. But, uh, you know, not an easy matchup for Thomas. I think he'll have more than enough volume to win. I think he can beat Carlton Davis in, you know, another matchup. It was just a good game for Davis. But, again, nobody's idea of an easy matchup. But never sit your studs in fantasy, everybody. Uh, with the Colts, T.Y. Hilton has not practiced all week with a groin injury. And Marcus Johnson is also out with a knee injury. So, Michael Pittman, their rookie, is in, like, this non-high-risk COVID group. So, it sounds like he'll be okay for Friday. But, oh, my goodness. I mean, him and Zach Pascal are pretty much the only guys left in the wide receiver room. I expect all the targets for the tight ends and running backs. Uh, you know, unfortunately, this matchup against the Ravens secondary. I know they're also missing guys because of COVID and everything. I just, you know, all the injuries going on now. It's absolutely madness, everyone. But uh, still just not really anyone in this Colts passing game I feel too good about. I would note that both Jonathan Taylor with the ankle and Jordan Wilkins with the groin have been practicing in full. Look, I understand. Like, I've watched every single Colts game this year. I've looked at the advanced metrics. I realized that Jonathan Taylor is towards the bottom of the league and forced missed tackles per rush. And Wilkins is, I believe, number one. But it's not this situation where Wilkins has just been outplaying Taylor on just an every single rep basis the entire season. Taylor is quite literally averaging more yards per carry and more yards per touch than Jordan Wilkins this season. And again, I understand Wilkins has better style points with it. He's looked better. He passes the eye test. But again, ever since Marlon Mack went out in week one, we have not seen like a normal Colts game where they can just, you know, kind of play in this back and forth, you know, setting that's never within kind of more than 10 points. Either way, it's literally been nothing but blowout or the Colts have gotten, you know, really far behind in the first half and had to put their foot on the gas in comeback mode. So it's either been, you know, Wilkins mode where they're just up multiple scores in the fourth quarter and they lean on him kind of like the Ravens do at Gus instead of keeping it on uh, with Ingram and, or, or Dobbins or they get down a lot and become Naeem Hines mode in the passing game. So look, it, Wilkins being there is bad for Taylor, but don't confuse that for being, you know, great news for Wilkins and this guy that we need to start treating as a top 20 back in his own right all of a sudden. I think both guys in this offense, uh, you know, at home can potentially be, you know, top 25 guys, but it's going to be tough to really treat either of them. I think that's more than boom or bust RB3 guys until there's some clarity. But, you know, I'm not fully given – I'm not buying this idea that Wilkins is just, you know, taking over the backfield right now. We're going to see, like, a healthy Jonathan Taylor standing on the sideline. I think it's going to continue to be split. And I do think in a game, if we can just get one neutral game script uh, for his Colts offense, we will see that Taylor uh, will be the guy leading the way in touches. Uh, with the Ravens, so Mark Ingram has not been practicing all week with an ankle injury. He is expecting to miss this game. J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards season everybody. Again, Justice Hill was not out there last week. That means we can fire up both these guys with some confidence. Uh, I have Dobbins as my RB18 this week. Gus Edwards as my RB19 just for some uh, you know, clarity. I got Damon Harris, DeAndre Swift ranked right behind them. I got the Bills guys behind them, Broncos guys. I do have Antonio Gibson, Justin Jackson, uh, Leonard Fournette ahead of them, but you know, we really can't fire up these Ravens guys with confidence 15 plus touches not a good matchup I mean the Colts have been the league's second best run defense behind only the Buccaneers or just against running backs um, uh, more specifically but I do think you know with Lamar out there on turf um, maybe could be a good situation where they can overcome it not having Ronnie Stanley is something we're really going to need to keep an eye on him moving forward but you know even losing him for uh, uh, just the way they did last week we did see uh, Dobbins and company still have some success running the ball so you're obviously not a better team without Ronnie Stanley but I think with 15 plus uh, touches in this offense. Dobbins and Edwards can still give us plenty of fantasy value. Uh, with the Giants, Sterling Shepard was limited on Thursday with toe and shoulder injuries. Should be fine, but he was a DMP earlier in the week, so don't worry. He's still fine. You know, wide receiver three. Devontae Freeman, back to being limited uh, with an ankle injury. So, you know, Slayton and Shepard, again, wide receiver threes. I just can't treat them as more than that this week. Daniel Jones has been the most pressured quarterback in the entire league and facing this, you know, Washington football team. Defensive line uh, just full of monsters, and they've been, you know, really just ending games this whole year, ever since week one against the Eagles, saw against the Cowboys, like they are good enough to just pretty much single-handedly thwart opposing offenses with their pass rush alone. I am just trying to pass in this passing game as much as possible. And honestly, the, the running game too, because we don't know if Freeman's going to come back and be limited or if he's going to get that same, you know, Saquon-esque role he was having before he was injured. Because last week, it was Wayne Gallman, Alfred Morris, and Deion Lewis in this horrific three-back committee. And I could see them, you know, riding with three or four of those guys uh, if Freeman gets back into action, not giving him that same role right away. So if you can avoid it, just 
just do not play a single football player on your fantasy football team from either the New York Giants or New York Jets this week. With the Falcons, Calvin Ridley uh, has not been practicing all week with a foot injury. Uh, not great. It looks like Christian Blake will probably be the next guy up. We also had Alamide Zacchaeus. You know, we'll work on that pronunciation too. But another guy that gets in there a lot. Uh, Russell Gage has been banged up, but he should be out there. Look, it, everything just points towards Julio Jones. You know, he should be getting fed. I would just point out that, you know, we saw Matt Ryan suffer without Julio Jones in the lineup. Don't be surprised if a similar thing happens with Calvin Ridley. I mean, actually, if you just look at adjusted yards per target for Ryan's career, he's been more efficient throwing the Calvin Ridley than Julio Jones. Ridley's number two and Julio's number three. I'm not trying to say Ridley is more important than Julio or anything like that. But, you know, look, Ridley's an awesome receiver. You take away an awesome receiver from an offense it would make sense if the quarterback isn't quite as good you know julio week i get that but this is you know i'm not not really looking to stack matt ryan too much i, I know the broncos defense isn't exactly chock full of world beaters but uh you know for fangio they're still a well-coached group so with the dolphins now we got miles gaskin on ir matt Breida was looking like you know the next guy up but now he's got a hamstring injury he hasn't practiced all week that leaves us with dark visor jordan howard patrick laird and something named salvin ahmed we'll see uh, it's gonna take until next week it looks like to get deandre washington in there and he can make this uh, further muddle up this committee but i think it's gonna be you know just 15 or so really inefficient carries to jordan howard and we'll probably see patrick laird getting the pass that more so if you're really desperate at running back you can do worse than jordan howard but I'm just really concerned about this uh, offense moving the ball. Tua looked awful last week. And he'll, he'll have better weeks moving forward. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But, you know, you would have liked to have Gaskin or at least Brita, somebody that you think could kind of take the stress off the defense. Now with Howard, teams are going to know more than ever that he's not going to be a factor in the passing game. I just don't think this is really helping uh, Tua all that much. Look, the Dolphins aren't bad. Their defense playing great this year. But the offensive line was abysmal last season. They've improved, but they're still below average. Devontae Parker's been banged up all year. I like Preston Williams. I like Mike Jusicki, but these guys were rotating with, you know, Isaiah Ford up until they traded him. So just not exactly the most fancy friendly situation for Tua to step into. Uh, hopefully he puts some better ball on film this week. Uh, with the Panthers, Christian McCaffrey back at practice, fully expected to be activated and good to go uh, this week. Yeah, I'm, you know, do not start Mike Davis if you can help it. I am not expecting, you know, more than three to five touches for him in this game unless, you know, game script gets really funky. Uh, you know, fire up Christian McCaffrey. I only have Alvin Kamara and Dalvin Cook ranked ahead of him this week. Uh, Zico Elliott's been limited with a hamstring injury. He is not a must start. I'm not going maybe, I have him as my RB14 this week behind Gurley, behind Montgomery, ahead of, uh, you know, Leonard Fournette, Justin Jackson, Antonio Gibson. So I can almost see myself moving him underneath that Gibson, maybe putting him just ahead of those Baltimore guys, maybe just behind. He's a top 20 back. It's going to be hard to bench him. If you are benching him, you better have, you know, all top 16 guys. It's absolutely wild we're at this case, but, you know, now you throw this little injury here. I just don't know how the Cowboys move the ball against the Steelers. I am honestly just frightened for whoever's going to be uh, under center there. And, you know, hey, maybe Zeke gets a screen or they do find a way to score a touchdown. It would likely be Zeke, but Again, the upside that we used to have in this Cowboys offense is all but gone. Uh, with the Jets, Jameson Crowder not practicing all week with the groin. Sam Darnold also not practicing with the shoulder. Look, Crowder's the only guy we can play if uh, if people are healthy in this offense. And it doesn't look like he's going to be healthy. So do not play anyone on the Jets. That is that. Uh, with the Patriots, Sony Michelle is back at practice with the quad. It's a situation where we don't know what he's doing on like a level term just yet because they have a, he's in that 21-day practice so window, whatever they call it. So just realize if Sonny Michelle is active on Monday night, like that is awful for Damian Harris. So if you have close lineup decisions, you know, one of the Ravens guys versus Damian Harris, you know, DeAndre Swift, uh, you, you know, even one of the Buffalo guys potentially, I would lean with, uh, you know, someone that we know is going to be, uh, you know, got their team's uh, back. Because if, look, if Sonny Michelle comes back, Damian Harris could very well just be siphoned away on the bench. He has played well, but Sonny Michelle was honestly putting up some of the best ball that we've seen from his career right before he got injured. Like, you, you want to talk about this Jordan Wilkins, Jonathan Taylor thing? It's the same exact way with New England, where Sonny Michelle is the one that's actually put forward much better advanced metrics in terms of broken tackles and yards after contact up or carry compared to Harris. So, Harris, hey, he's, he's fallen to the end zone. He's a big dude running hard. I'm not trying to say he's awful. It's been a small sample size, too, but, you know, don't just as 
assume Sony Michelle just lost a job here. I think he comes back and he either takes the role or we could just get an even further messy four back backfield. So either way, not loving that for the guys. And you know, I, I hopefully we'll get some more uh, just knowledge on Sony Michelle ahead of Friday about what his chances are. At a minimum, it should be Saturday that we hear. So I don't think you're going to have to go to you know Sunday at noon wondering, but uh, just just realize, or I guess it'd be Monday night, but just realize with Sony, uh, you know, potentially lingering there. If you can sell high on Damian Harris, now is the time to do it. Got five more, everyone. Quick shout out before we do that, though. Uh, PFF and Sunday Night Football's Chris Collinsworth is teaming up with one of the best players on and off the field. 49ers All Pro cornerback Richard Sherman. The Chris Collinsworth podcast featuring Richard Sherman is available now wherever you find your podcast. Uh, they will provide the most interesting football conversation in sports every single week, and sometimes that means the discussion will venture off the field, too. Additionally, Chris will be taking a dive in the game of football as he sees it, inviting in the best and brightest to talk about everything that's happening in the great game of football. So mark your calendars. You do not want to miss the best 60 minutes of insight this season. Five more, everyone. Sammy Watkins, Chiefs wide receiver, is back to a limited practice uh, after missing these last few games with a hamstring injury. So last week, Miko Hartman actually played more snaps than Demarcus Robinson and the artist known as Byron Pringle for the first time all season. So hey, if Watkins is back, though, we saw us in the playoffs. We saw us early in the year. It's Tyreek 1, Sammy 2, and the rest of these guys rotate snaps. So look, Miko is absolutely fantastic. I think he's second in the entire league in yards per target. Like When you give him the ball, good things happen. But you know they value run blocking and stuff, and you know, who, who am I to disagree with what Andy Reid and, you know, these Chiefs, the Chiefs offense, who they want to have there on the, on the field. Look, Miko's a great player. They use him well. He's incredibly efficient with the touches. They just don't want to give him more because he doesn't fit their offense the way they want him to. So, you know, we can hope that he gets more touches, but, uh, you know, it's not good in fantasy land to be, you know, too high on these guys that are not getting those sort of consistent touches. So even with, you know, him popping off over these last few weeks, uh, I've been I've been pretty much writing him off ever since we saw Byron Pringle continue to have such a big role uh, in that kind of first game without Sammy. So, you know, Miko Hardman is someone that I think is droppable the second Sammy Watkins is confirmed back. With the Cardinals, Kenyon Drake, you know, we're hearing Cliff Kingsbury say that he's day-to-day and the thing's not as serious as they think, but he has been not practicing all week with an ankle injury. So Chase Edmonds' Chase Edmund season, he is my RB8. The only guys I have ranked ahead of him are Josh Jacobs, James Robinson, James Conner, Derrick Henry, Chris McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, and Alvin Kamara with the Lions. So Matthew Stafford is on the COVID list right now. He's eligible to return on Sunday, though, if he gets negative tests until then. So otherwise, it's Chase Daniel season. And if you ever want to have a fun time, go to a Over the Cap or Spotrack, you know, one of the contract sites. Look at all the money Chase Daniel has made throughout his career, despite doing largely nothing other than, you know, be backups on, a, you know, smart coaching staffs or whatnot. So credit to you, Chase Daniel, the, you know, the, the, the real life Alex Moran, pretty much getting those checks and not doing much. Gotta love the life of a backup quarterback quarterback but if Daniel's under center that is bad news for everyone involved in this offense you can still fire up Hawkinson and Swift but I would be you know much much more uh, bearish on Marvin Jones uh, in that situation so if Stafford's out there give me Marvin Jones as a true wide receiver too Hawkinson as a top five tight end if not you know dropping Hawkinson down a little bit but still starting Marvin Jones I would not be recommending to start without Matthew Stafford under center Buccaneers wide receiver Chris Goblin has been limited all week with the finger injury. It sounds like, you know, he has a true 50-50 shot to play in this game. And look, I do think it's a situation where Antonio Brown is going to probably be the guy leading the way in targets in this offense. Uh, we saw, we've seen a lot more four wide receiver formations. That was kind of the game uh, when... We had a game-by-game game breakdown after the week where Leonard Fournette came out and uh, Bruce Aarons called him his nickel back. And uh, Dwayne McFarlane, who we have on the game-by-game game breakdowns every other week, mentioned how he should actually be called the dime back because they're doing it with uh, four wide receivers out there. So I like that note, and it does make sense that you know if they are going to go four wide receivers and everyone's healthy, Mike Evans on one end, uh, Scotty Miller on the other end, A.B. and Chris Goblin out of the slot. Absolute madness. And, of course, you can get Rob Gronkowski, line him up wherever you want uh, as you're doing that. I think Gronk's still going to have enough. Uh, you know, red zone scoring upside to do his thing. Like, I would say adding a B, it lowers everyone's ceilings to an extent, but it doesn't hurt the floors as much as I think people are making it out to be. Adding a B to this offense could unlock the damn thing and just make it the league's single best offense. And we're scoring so many points, it doesn't even matter. So it's a lot of mouse to feed, but like the you know early season Cowboys offense where we we're just firing up everybody because of all the yards and points going on. Uh, you know, much better defense in Tampa Bay. I understand that it's not a one for one comparison, but I do just think there will be enough points, enough passing yards for each of Goblin 
Godwin, AB, and Evans to be somewhat consistent uh, fancy wide receiver twos. Not the wide receiver ones you draft them to be. I get that, but you know we gotta make 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 do with what we can at this point. Uh, final point: uh, Texans tight end Jordan Aikens has been practicing in full all week, all week with an ankle and concussion. Like, look with the Seahawks, with the Texans, with the Vikings, a couple other teams out there, maybe Browns. When all these guys are healthy, it's very tough to kind of rely on one single tight end and expect big games. They're all good, but they just rotate, and that's what Darren Fells and Jordan Aikens do in Houston. So I know Fells has been usable. Aikens was kind of usable earlier in the year. It's just so back and forth. So, you know, if you're truly in a bind, then maybe, but I don't know. I have both these Houston guys ranked outside of my top 20 options at the position this week. You know, I would say guys like Eric Ebron, Hayden Hurst, Jordan Reed. Uh, You know, I I want, okay, not Jordan Reed. (laughs) That one did not go so well. Uh, but, you know, Jared Cook, Hayden Hurst, Eric Ebron, uh, Jasicki, uh, Logan Thomas, any of those guys I would want over the Texans tight ends, no doubt about it. That is going to do it, everyone. Thank you, as always, for listening to the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at PFF underscore fantasy. Find me on Twitter at iHeartitz, I-H-A-R-T-I-T-Z. Got content coming to you every single day of the week, podcast writings, whatever medium you preferred. So best of luck to everyone in week nine. You know, shout out to me on the old Twitter store. If you ever got the tightest question that you just cannot quite figure out, I will try to get to you when I can. So thank you, everyone. Until next time, take care. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.